Anybody else at Kelly? Yes, you're all set. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Scarborough Public Schools Board of Education meeting for December 3rd, 2020. Could I please have the attendance? Sure. Mrs. Giftos? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Casalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Sither? Here. Mrs. Turner? Here. Mr. Bennett? Here. And Ms. Giftos? Here. 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 Great. Right. Could everyone please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda item 3.0, oh, sorry, agenda item 4.0 is adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments to the agenda tonight? I have one. I would like to move uh, agenda item 6.4 SHS 2020 school trip um, to after agenda item 6.1 enrollment update to allow Mr. Tantolito to speak before we hear from our other presenters this evening. Agenda item 5.0, are there any public comments on tonight's agenda item? Seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Agenda item 6.0, superintendent's report. Thank you, April. Um, I would like to make an announcement tonight, so you could just bear with me for a couple minutes. That would be wonderful. I wanted to inform the greater Scarborough School community that I have communicated to the board leadership that my two-year commitment as interim superintendent will soon be upon us. I am most fortunate to have had this opportunity to work in a high-performing school district and to serve the families of the greater Scarborough community. When I accepted this position, it seemed like an opportunity to stretch my skills and become part of a learning community, community that was moving forward and changes that would only enhance opportunities for all students. Fortunately for me, it was. I remain committed to the remainder of my time here, which ends June 30th, 2021. And without question, I will support the district by making the transition seamless for the new superintendent. Again, I am forever grateful to have had this interim experience, to have been part of this amazing Scarborough School community. Thank you so much. And that's my little announcement. And um, again, I just, you know, I was in the high school today in the morning, early morning and walking around and I'm looking at the students and how respectful, how polished, how focused they are. And I just think it's a tribute to the Scarborough community. It's a wonderful community. It's an excellent school system. And I have just really enjoyed my time here. Um, and I thank you again, and, and I like to leave it at that. I, I, uh, I'm an interim. I haven't been here for 20 years. I kind of want to go quietly and low key, but I really want to make sure that we can get a, a person in this position, and I'm committed to working with that person and the administrative team to make it happen. So thank you, April, and that's my superintendent's report. In addition to that, December enrollment, I'd like to just go over that. Again, we try to do this monthly. 
And as you will see um, at the very top going across, we're comparing this year from last year. And then we're gonna look at how many homeschool students we have, how many remote students and how many hybrid. So starting with the high school, we are at 944 students currently. Last year we had 988. We have three homeschool students and 112, 100% remote. And hybrid, we have 836. At the middle school level, currently we have 704 students. A year ago, we had 699. We have 19 homeschool, 116 remote, and we have 592 at uh, the hybrid. Wentworth, we have 610 students. 666 last year. And with homeschool, we have 19, and we have currently 78% remote. And then in addition to that, I just wanna get, whoops, sorry about that. Just lost my camera. Oh man. Well, let's see. Well, sorry about, can you, uh, yeah. While, um, while Sandy's working to kind of reconnect, can I, can I ask a clarifying question? I think Diane, you'll probably be able to answer this. I, I know I've asked this before, but since we have some different people in the audience tonight, I just wanted, I, I just pulled out my calculator. I'm totally that guy. And I was just looking at the numbers. And, and as I recall, the way this works is that the total number, so like the high school at 944, that includes the remote and hybrid people, but not the homeschools, right? Yes, that's correct. And that would be the true of the 2019 number as well. That number would not include anyone that's homeschooled. Right. We have, you know, we've actually, you know, never on a monthly basis reported out homeschoolers before this year. And when um, we went to the hybrid model this year and understanding that, you know, folks are making many different decisions in our current environment with this pandemic, we felt like it was important to um, be reporting that during this school year. Right, okay, I just wanted to, I was just trying to add everything up in my head and so I, I would just wanted to, for anyone at home that's as data obsessed as I am, I just wanted to ask that. Right. Is there anything I can do, Sandy? There we go. Okay, sorry about that. You hear me okay? No problem, thank you. All right, Wentworth School, let's go back to that. Currently uh, 610 students a year ago, 666. In our home school we had uh, 19 and 78 students went remote and hybrid 532. At Blue Point, currently 199 students and last year we had 202. And again, if you look at all three elementary schools, homeschool, uh, we're looking at 34 students, again, K through two. At Blue Point, we have 38 students who are 100% remote, and we have 161 students at hybrid. At Eight Corners, currently we have 227 students. Last year, we had 240. And when we look at the remote students, 100% remote, it's 54 students. And hybrid, we have 173 students. At Pleasant Hill, currently have 183 students. A year ago, 204. When you look at the 100% remote, we have 37 students. And with hybrid, we have 146. So when we add this all up, currently this year, we have 2,872. 
a year ago, 2,999. And with homeschool students, total of 76. 100% remote in the district is 435 students. And when we look at hybrid, it's 2,436. That is it for enrollment. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, Mr. Trentolito, I have promoted you to a panelist, so you should be able to unmute. And if you want to turn your camera on, you can, but that's your choice. Yeah, I didn't realize it wasn't on. I apologize. Um, no worries. Oh, can you see me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes, welcome. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for, by the way, thank you for putting me toward the front of the, um, the agenda for this evening. And um, I just want to just don't want to take too much of your time, but first I just want to echo Superintendent Prince's comments about Scarborough schools and definitely the high school. Um, <clears throat> as we've been navigating this semester with uh, the hybrid schedule and, and kids being remote, I must say overall the kids have been phenomenal. Um, it's been, a, from my perspective anyway, I'm on the senior hallway on the first floor, but it's just been a really awesome um, transition from quarter one to quarter two, and now we're heading toward the, the winter break. So mm -hmm. I totally agree with um, Superintendent Prince that the high school students have been phenomenal. Uh, the reason I'm here tonight uh, is to look ahead to 2022, which sounds very far away, and regarding international travel, which sounds obviously like a complete impossibility right now. Um, but I have been working for about 10 years with EF Tours and have conducted 10 trips, I think, now uh, to Europe with students from Scarborough High School. Uh, EF is the nation's oldest uh, student travel company uh, in the United States. And as you know from some of you who have heard me come before the board in the past, uh, we have multiple uh, student travel programs at Scarborough High School, uh, primarily through the foreign language program, but we've also had student travel and other departments, including uh, what I do in the social studies department. Uh, we currently have a trip scheduled for June of this year. So June of 2021, I have about 26 students uh, signed up to go to Italy. Um, and believe it or not, uh, EF uh, Tours um, has signaled that they are going to notify us by the first week of May if we're a go or if we're not a go. Obviously, we're at the early phases of a vaccine obviously can't predict where we're going in the next six to seven months, but EF Tours remains optimistic. And what's really astonishing too, looking at our, our student community and the parents in Scarborough, um, is that virtually everyone has sat tight and is remaining on the tour. I've had, I think I've had one person who is contemplating uh, withdrawing from the tour. And the great thing too, real quickly, is that EF uh, promises a full refund and or a travel voucher for a student, a future student, trip if a student uh, decides either they don't want to go in June and or if we are unable to go in June of 2021. At the same time, if you really want to know the history, I had a trip scheduled in June of this past this past June, so June of 2020, and that is also pending and uh, on hiatus. So I have, so make a long story short, I'm going to be run if we go, I'll be running two tours within two weeks of each other in late June and early July. The delayed June of 2020 trip to London, Paris, and Berlin. And then we return and then about 10 days later in July, um, a group of students will be going to Italy that has been planned all along for June of 2021. So we're all just holding tight and we'll see where we are in early May. And at this point, most students seem to be signaling they're ready to travel and or are willing to take the voucher and go at a later time when it's convenient for them and they're possibly their college careers uh, to do a student tour at a later date. Why I'm here tonight uh, is to talk about a trip in June of 2022, and that would be to Greece. Um, I've conducted this tour in the past, uh, about four years ago, we went to Greece, it includes Athens and some of the islands. It's a historical uh, tour. The kids who went on it had a phenomenal experience. And the reason I'm coming to you tonight is simply to plan ahead. And even though 2022 sounds very far away, um, generally about 18 to 24 months before departure is when um, I promote the trips. And I think the biggest reason is it gives people more time to plan. And for many students, particularly who finance the trip themselves, quite a bit of our students fund these trips on their own um, earnings. It gives them uh, two years to basically uh, plan ahead 
uh, finance it and, and plan accordingly that way. Um, so I'm tentatively looking at holding a informational meeting for students who might be interested in traveling in 2022, uh, possibly maybe late December or more likely in early mid-January of 2021. So I just wanted to reach out to you tonight to give you an update on, on student travel um, with, with my program at Scarborough High School. And I do know that we have, um, in the past, we've had trips, of course, in foreign language with Spanish and French and, and other programs in the building. And I do think the kids who do uh, participate in these programs are really changed by them. They inevitably, as I hear from them, and they go off to college and beyond, um, they off, often do a semester, a year abroad in college and or graduate school. And uh, it's just a phenomenal experience. And I'm very lucky to be a part of the program. Um, so I just want to reach out to you tonight and thank you for your attention. If you have questions for me about any of these uh, possible trips looking at COVID right now, um, I'd be certainly happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for coming and giving us what is was a pleasantly optimistic update. <laughs> and we, I will certainly keep everything crossed that we find ourselves in a very different place in the spring and that these students are able to take advantage of these amazing opportunities. Um, and thank you so much for being such an amazing ambassador for our kids because these are once in a lifetime opportunities and they're very lucky to have somebody who is as dedicated to showing the world to them as you are. So thank you. I don't see any hands for comments. Oh, Alicia has one. Go ahead, Alicia. Of course it's me. Uh, I, I just wondered if the agency has ever um, discussed an opportunity to do some sort of funding for students who may not be able in a position to afford to afford um, tr travel independently, um, or if you if you know of a fund um, some sort of fundraising or grant option or. Good question. Um, EF tours uh, definitely encourage. Honestly how I have primarily handled it. I know of teachers who have done student travel in other schools across the country. And some of them have uh, engaged in a, like a, fun, a community fundraiser or a uh, group fundraiser for the trip, you know, for the students that are planning on traveling. Um, I have not done that in my experience. I haven't, honestly, I don't, I do think the, the impression is that it's, the kids that are going on their trips are, are very privileged and, and have this incredible opportunity. Um, in reality, what I've really seen is many of them, almost sometimes all of them, are um, funding it themselves and or funding it with um, maybe partial gift for graduation, that kind of thing. Uh, but your idea about having a like a planned fundraiser for uh, a student group to go to go on one of these tours is an excellent one. And it's something that I've definitely have thought about in the past. I, um, through Model United Nations, I, I do a, um, a one or two fundraisers a year for a college scholarship fund. And um, I've thought about doing a similar type of maybe annual fundraiser for kids who participate in it, who then could, we could distribute the profits and apply to, to kids' um, bottom line for being able to participate. So that's definitely something, um, Alicia, that I uh, would consider and I would definitely welcome any ideas or uh, suggestions from anyone um, in the community. Uh, but that is a very good point uh, because um, there, there are definitely ways that we could do that to get more kids on board. I, I would say real quickly, what I'm really impressed with is that through the years, and generally I bring on average 25 plus students. Uh, one year, about four years ago, I took 30, 40 kids, uh, which was basically, we had our own tour by ourselves. Uh, inevitably, we usually end up traveling with one or two other high schools from across the country. Uh, but the fact that so many kids from the high school in the past have really worked hard to to come up with the funds and prioritize, you know, that in their budget to, to make it happen is impressive, too. But um, but I certainly would welcome any ideas. And I um, I will look into doing something like that for the 2022 uh, trip as well. And I'll probably bring that up at the travel meeting. And the meeting real quickly is generally just an informational meeting, people who wanna come, it'll be virtual of course. Um, and it's for students and parents to simply learn more about student travel with EF. And then generally what I've tried to do in the past is have former students who've been on trips to come and um, 
speak to to people in the meeting about their travel experiences and and we do discuss um, the financial component of it in general last thing i should i feel like I, <laughs> i'm in sales here uh but in general ef is actually one of the more economical um student travel companies in the united states there are several competitors of ef that i do hear from and they're often significantly more expensive so i think one of the reasons the company has been so successful is that they're they're economical enough and can reach a, a broad uh, number of students from all different kind of socioeconomic backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate you fitting in, fitting me in, and uh, please uh, stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you. And with that, Sandy, I will hand, hand it back over to you um, to introduce our building principal. Or is Monique going first? Monique is going to go first, yes. OK, perfect. Good evening. Are you all able to hear me okay? Yes. Nodding heads. Wonderful. Uh, thank you um, for um, having us tonight um, and providing the opportunity to share some data that we've been collecting and beginning to analyze. Um, two sources of data I'm going to talk about tonight. First will be the back to school survey uh, from Panorama and the fall diagnostic assessment results from the iReady testing. So buckle your seat belts and get ready, um, Mr. Gill, to um, get your data geek on, and we will get going here with lots of data. <clears throat> so a little bit of background information about each of these tools. Panorama is, uh, provides us with the ability to do surveys. Um, primarily, we were attracted to it because of social emotional surveys, but it also has family and school community surveys, and we've taken advantage of this um, for our um, start team um, when we got going and now our back to school survey as well. So it, the surveys are provided to students in 3, 5 and 6, 12, two different versions with slightly different vocabulary, but essentially the same topics and questions. Also, we survey our families and we also surveyed staff, our instructional staff, as well as our non-instructional staff. Uh, the questions are organized around particular topics, and each topic has anywhere from two to six questions. We honed down quite a bit of what they offered us just because we wanted to make sure that the surveys could be completed within about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, the survey window was about 10 days in early November, uh, and there is a link in this slideshow, and this will be made public, and I will share results on the web page um, as well as share in the weekly newsletter to all the detailed results and reports. I'm just doing an overview tonight on, on Panorama. I ready, we're sharing the fall diagnostic tonight. Uh, we, uh, I've been doing a little bit of data analysis and look, taking a look at what the impact of our closure last spring has had on student performance. So I'd like to share a bit of that with you as well tonight. Know that iReady assesses reading and mathematics and our students in grades K through nine take the assessment. Um, you will see some, again, overview information. Know that within each con of these content area, there are smaller subsets. We refer to those as domains, which teachers use to inform their instruction. It's not an a achievement test. It really uh, points towards instructional level um, it also calibrates the online instruction piece, which is designed to provide instruction in the areas that students have gaps. And our <clears throat> survey window, we, it was about a month. It started in October, uh, and we ended about just after, uh, on November 13th, just after the, um, it, it took uh, veterans holiday. It took us a little longer this year because of our hybrid structure. Uh, a little bit next slide indicates an overview of the survey topics. 
Uh, I'm not going to go through each one, um, but there are the responses also in that second row. I will um, share with you that for the grade uh, three, five students, our Wentworth students, that was a rate of 52%. For our students in 612, it was 65%. For our families, we had a return rate of 45%, so roughly half. K-12 instructional staff, we were at 81%. And for our non-instructional staff, 38%. And now a little bit of information in regard to um, what, how the survey is constructed. The reports come back in a percent favorable. Uh, and the percent favorable means that for any of the questions, you'll notice that example question there, if there are five choices and they are listed from more negative to more positive or more favorable, they set a bit of a high bar around favorable. So you'll notice not at all excited, slightly excited and somewhat excited. Those three responses would be considered less favorable. They pull the top two favorable responses um, from the data. So you will see a percent favorable. No, those are the top two choices. If there were five questions, if there were seven, it would be the top three. So for our students at grades three, five, um, and this, these are the four topics we assessed, and this is in the order of percent favorable. With student engagement um, scoring the highest in terms of percentage favorable, um, and I'll speak a little bit to each of these. Our student engagement is really around how much our students pay attention to and are invested in what goes on in the classroom. And not surprisingly, they're pretty excited about what's going on in school. Uh, and we'll see some data that confirms that in a bit. Uh, student relationships is really about the adult and student relationships and that connectedness and that sense of belonging. So student relationships is an important one. Also academic needs and academic needs, uh, the questions range anywhere from confidence in a, how a student feels confident in their ability to do well in school, all the way to uh, how's your internet connectivity? Are you having problems with that? So it really tries to get a gauge on what their needs are academically. And then the learning model is about a couple of different things. The learning model is really taking a look at how content our students, families and staff are with the amount of time they're spending in school um, and the amount of time speaking with teachers and with friends, as well as the ease of technology use. Um, certainly that question within the learning model around the ease of technology use um, scored quite favorably. Um, not to um, usurp the final slide, but it may not be too much of a surprise, but at 3.5 in particular, um, in response to the qu a certain question in there, over half the students at Wentworth want more time in school. Not surprising. Uh, likewise, at 612, um, if we jump to the learning model piece, um, <clears throat> uh, they also want more time in school. Um, a spot when the learning model that was particularly low that we're paying attention to is their um, satisfaction with their time spent speaking with their friends and interacting with their friends. That was less favorable, only scoring at about 26% within that category, which brought that learning model down. Um, you'll notice here at 612, there's an additional topic, school public health safety measures, and that really um, addresses how students feel about the safety protocols that are in place in, at school and how um, easy they are to follow. Uh, and you'll notice that the school public health measures across all these data sets score rather more favorable than the other areas. Um, the two areas that we're diving into a bit is the learning model um, <clears throat> because it scored relatively less favorably. Uh, and also the student relationships piece. And it's no surprise given the, the um, environment we're in is that our students um, reported that um, their connections to students was only at about 28% favorable uh, and their connections to adults um, was 29% favorable. Uh, so those are two areas um, our building principals and our staffs are gonna be looking into um, more closely. In terms of families, uh, 
we did ask the topic around additional family assistance, and this was in regard to um, uh, food security, child care, internet access, those sorts of things. Um, if you recall in the spring, we asked those questions as well. Um, here you'll notice that the learning model is also relatively low, but interestingly enough, um, they're over 55% favorable um, was the score around the question with the satisfaction with the way in which the learning is currently structured. Um, less favorable at 49% was our family's confidence in their ability to support their children. And in terms of student needs, our families are worried about their children. Um, there's a concern over SEL and peer relationships. That score was at about 49%. Um, in terms of student needs. Um, and then, um, but on the upside, um, relationships with adults was much more positive scoring, that question scoring at about 73% favorable. So in terms of instructional staff, um, you'll notice again, school public health measures are up there. Interestingly enough, student engagement is as well. Um, and diving into um, one of the questions there is that um, our instructional staff are noticing that students are quite engaged when they're in school. That was at 77% favorable. Um, and yet um, engagement um, is a little less favorable in the virtual environment, which was about 34%. So we're gonna need to tap into and dive into that to learn more about what's going on there and develop some strategies. Uh, in terms of student needs, um, across the grade levels range from 80% to 28% when I looked at it across grade levels. And the lowest concern area was in the, um, our teachers are worried about our students' social emotional well-being as well. And that was at a 27% uh, favorable. As you recall, we began the year focusing on the social emotional learning pieces. Um, we met this uh, just before this meeting with the K-12 SEL committee, and we had conversations around this data, and they had an opportunity to begin to take a look at their action plans around that. And the learning model, um, our teachers reported uh, that their um, confidence in their ability to help those who need it the most was at about 13%. And then the impact of this learning model on their adult social emotional well-being was only at 7% favorable. So our K-12 SEL committee is gonna be doing some work focusing on adult SEL, uh, as well as the wellness committee. Um, we'll have access to this data and take a look at resources um, so that we might help better support our staff. Non-instructional staff really mirrors the instructional staff. We did not ask the topic around student engagement, but wanted to hear from our non-instructional staff um, as well because they too have a perspective on our students. Uh, and in terms of student needs, they're worried about student social emotional well-being as well with only about a 28% favorable response there. And yet, interestingly enough, when we asked the question about whether uh, the extent to which they're worried about student behavior, um, that was 72% favorable, So, our, which, was, which was interesting. Uh, the learning model, um, the one question in terms that was there in terms of how is this learning model impacting your social emotional well-being, the percent favorable there was 34%. So in summary, um, if we were to draw some broad um, observations around this data, um, higher favorable uh, results uh, were the safety pieces, uh, people are feeling good about the safety uh, protocol that are in place. And that we saw across students, families, and staff. Also student engagement um, from instructional staff um, feedback and student feedback was more favorable, had higher favorable results than some of the other topics. Communication also was there about mid-range. Of concern, and we need to do some more um, um, study of the data, and have conversations is the learning model, particularly that question around social emotional well being. We are all stressed. This is an anxious time, and we need to help support each other in um, taking care of ourselves. Student needs as well. Um, staff are worried about our kiddos, and families are worried about our students as well. And so we're going to be taking a look at that data more deeply as well and see what kind of action planning we can do around that. 
and student relationships. Um, not surprisingly um, for our adolescents who are quite concerned about their social lives, they're not feeling as connected as maybe um, they want to be and maybe should be at this point in their lives. I'm gonna switch gears into the iReady very quickly, unless there are some quick questions. Uh, Nick has a question, go ahead, Nick. I'm fortunate that my mute button is the right way, April, otherwise I'd be totally confused like you. Um, I just wanted to ask a really quick question. So obviously that, that survey is very powerful. And of course, when we're looking at surveys, the number one thing we want to think about is validity, which is why using a product like that, as opposed to some homegrown product, it has a lot more um, clout. And so I just, I just kind of wanted to ask, do we have any kind of information about the validity of that survey, how widely it's used, what kind of information we've gotten back that it's telling us what we think it's telling us? Yeah, the um, Panoram for Education, they're involved in over, their surveys are used in over 1 million, uh, uh, wow. 1 million students. They're used nationally. I participate in some of their professional development, so I am able to network um, with uh, leaders across the country. Um, so it has gone through and met validity and reliability benchmarks. Um, that's what these folks do, and they're tapped out of some of the work that out of um, Harvard University and some of the um, work that's done with um, research and education um, out of Harvard. Perfect. So it is um, well grounded. The other piece that it also adds for us is, and there's an element within the reporting software called Playbook. And they have a relationship with a number of different um, providers, whether those are activities, learning activities, um, uh, those sorts of things. Um, everything from second step, all evidence-based sorts of activities from a variety of organizations. So as we look online at the results, we have the ability to also break it out and break it down. But what happens is they are playbook suggestions are being made, what activities. So for example, in the adult SEL, there are adult SEL sorts of activities from which the K-12 committee can draw from to implement um, with students um, as well as with staff. Great, thank you so much. Alicia? Thank you. Um, I was really encouraged when I saw the, the data. I, I thought, you know, how favorable it really appeared to be. And, and I wasn't surprised about the um, response related to social emotional learning. I think it's sort of a microcosm of what we're seeing in society in general. And I don't want to focus on my own kids and own interests, but I, that's what I know, you know, most where I get the most feedback. And, you know, I do hear from, from peers that, that, you know, that they're concerned about it. And one of the feedbacks that I've heard from um, my middle school daughter is about mask breaks and, and interacting um, with peers and how that has been difficult and become even more difficult during the colder weather, that that sort of limits their ability to interact. And so I thought that that was interesting feedback from her and I, it made me wonder sort of what the other schools that I don't know about are, are doing and, and how, given our climate, especially unfortunately, um, how we can foster those relationships safely and, and, you know, they're there, it's like they're so close and it's such a, you know, and I know that you've been really thinking outside of the box and I was just wondering what what steps you've been thinking about as that has become a, a barrier? Uh, that's something that the principals can better answer because they are um, <clears throat> living it every day um, in terms of the constraints within their buildings and the safety protocol. Uh, I do know that I have listened into conversations um, um, that they've had in trying to think about the many different ways that they can accommodate that. Diane? Yeah, I was just going to add that the other interesting phenomenon that's happened in the past couple of weeks, Alicia, is the state has changed the requirements around mass breaks, and they've really tightened them up. And so um, mass breaks can't be longer than five minutes. Students have to be 
um, you know, not moving around. It's much more prescriptive than it was um, earlier in the year. And, and again, my sense about that is um, that they tightened up those requirements as the number of cases in the state began to increase. So I absolutely hear what you're saying. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's just so sad, you know? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you at all. Thank you. So we're just gonna have to be even more creative. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not seeing any other comments, Monique, so if you'd like to keep going. Sure. So in terms of the iReady data, um, what I'm providing, we have different, within the application, we have the ability to look at it from different views, a beginning of year view, a standard view, and an end of year view. I'm just making it clear that I'm, we're looking this today, so for consistency's sake, out of the beginning year view. Um, and what that means in terms of these little triangles is that green portion uh, represents on or above grade level. But know that um, the yellow, um, two grade levels below, please know that if you are in the fall of your third grade year, anything grade two, which you might think might be a full year below, is consider still considered green because you haven't started your third grade year yet. So it's just a different view we use as we look towards um, the winter and into the end of the year, we use the other views, which gives us a more, um, a more refined look at where students are. Uh, and again, it, this is instructional level, um, not um, achievement, and that it, it also calibrates the online instruction. So for reading, um, what you have in the next slide uh, is reading. And if we look at all the students who were assessed in the beginning of the year, fall 2019, you'll no notice that across all the schools, 83% of our students were at or above grade level. You'll also notice as a result of this fall's assessment, all the students who were assessed in that green area on or above grade level is 87%. So some of the notions and wonders and worries and anxiety that um, I had been fielding um, is, oh my gosh, our kids are gonna be so behind. This is going to be catastrophic, um, on and on and on. Um, and our charge last year was to continue the learning. So I'm gonna share with you some bits of data here around that, some different views of the data. Um, <clears throat> know that with this, um, in 2019, we did not start, this did not include our kindergartners. Um, and in fall of 2020, we did not assess our 10th graders. So I'll point some of those pieces out as we go along. In mathematics, you'll notice if you focus on that tier one, 85% in the fall of 2019, 86% in terms of on or ready for grade level this year in fall of 2020. I've even had staff ask the question, well, did they adjust their standards? No, they have not adjusted their standards. They're using this against the same set of standards. So breaking it out by building, and this is gonna get a little tiny in terms of the screen, but here's Blue Point, Eight Corners and Pleasant Hill in terms of reading. And again, you'll see that consistency off by a few percentage points for the students who are at or above grade level. If we look at math for the primary in the next slide, you'll notice the same thing across all three schools, pretty consistent. In some cases, the percentage of students and their readiness has gone up. <clears throat> in Wentworth and middle school, and again, this is reading for Wentworth, you'll notice 87% and then beginning of fall 2020, 89%. For the middle school, you'll notice for reading 81%, and you will notice a drop, a bit of a drop here, 78%. And there's some other data that we're still um, going through um, to find out a little bit more about in terms of some of the um, drops. So if we look at mathematics, <clears throat> In mathematics at Wentworth, you'll see 90% and 90% between last fall and this fall. 
you will see a drop at the middle school, 86% to 76%. And that's something where um, we still need to do some data mining around. The next slide, uh, you know, as you look at those, you can say, well, if we look school to school, you only have two grade levels, roughly two grade levels that are consistent because you've got a batch of kids leaving one year and a batch of kids coming in the next year. So it really isn't apples to apples. So what this chart tries to do is to take a look at the same cohort of students. And this is where we start to see um, some potential differences. So if you look, this is reading and these are the cohorts. Grade one in the fall of 2019 in that reddish, light red, that's 97% of our students were at or above grade level. That same group of students this fall are second graders. Their score was at 88%. But if you look across those colors of similar colors, you see 92 and 89 for second grade. You see 87, the third grader is moving into fourth, 87% and 93%. So there are some differences across cohorts and that can be in part the cohort. It could be a number of different things. We're still trying to tease those pieces out. If we take a look at math, in math, you'll notice that quite possibly those differences are a little greater than in reading. Uh, I've been in communication with the um, folks at iReady to try and get a handle on what does the national picture look like here and it's pretty consistent that they have seen nationally about a 6% drop um, in reading cohort data, but in mathematics, it's a little bit larger. I think it's around uh, 14 to 18% um, in terms of um, differences between fall and fall. And they grabbed their fall data earlier than we did this year. So they're still working on that data. They're still mining that data. Uh, and so lastly, in terms of an overview, um, uh, what we really need to note is that we set a goal for ourselves. Yes, it was emergency learning. Yes, it was school closure, but we wanted to continue the learner learning and we wanted our students to stay connected as a learning community. And they did that. The majority of students did that. They continued their learning. And so I think we really do need to celebrate our teachers and celebrate our parents for their work and helping to support students. And of course, the students themselves uh, who continued their learning um, and all the folks who were involved um, <clears throat> in helping um, to make sure that um, that period of time last spring and that learning last year um, uh, the impact was minimal. The cohort data in reading had a less of a drop than in math, and we are um, still exploring that. Um, the, all that said, um, I wanna be right up front that we still have some students who are struggling. They're not exactly where we want them to be, and we wanna make sure that we continue to monitor them and provide the support that they need to ensure that they make progress towards grade level achievement. Happy to answer any questions that you might have about that. Monique, I don't know if you're even going to believe me, but no one has their hand raised. Wonderful, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> no, Monique, thank you. And thank you for giving us you know, a high level overview. I know that as a parent, I had been anxious to hear back on some of the iReady data. Um, this is a lot to take in and a lot to process in terms of thinking about where some of those discrepancies come from. Um, but I certainly appreciate you um, giving your time to us tonight. So thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving on in our agenda, um, we are at agenda item 6.2, remote learning preparedness. And I have taken the opportunity to promote our building principles to become panelists. Okay. So I'm gonna kick this section off for us. Um, so um, as requested, our principals um, have put together some slides for you this evening 
to give you an update on um, our learning plans uh, if we needed to go into a fully remote model um, for any period of time. So happy to um, kick that off. Kelly, if you could move to the next slide. So just um, to frame this work a little bit um, more for all of you this evening, um, we would first of all like to thank you very much um, for the additional time that was recently granted, um, especially at our younger levels where um, there may not be that same synchronous connection happening um, because of different developmental needs of our students. I know that our staff benefited greatly from the time to really dig in and drill down. Um, we want to remind everyone that as these plans were put together, there were a number of resources that were utilized, starting with um, recommendations from our start work this summer, um, examining what our current learning model looks like for hybrid, uh, they have utilized all of the staff, family, and student feedback from the Panorama survey that you just got um, a high-level overview of. Uh, they also utilized the current remote teaching expertise. There's my little dog. See, I started talking. Um, <laughs> sorry. And um, so, you know, we have some teachers that are doing fully remote, and so there were some great lessons learned from them. And um, then they examined what are some of the best practices um, that are out there around distance learning. And so there are a couple of resources that are right here on the slide. The distance learning playbook um, has been utilized K-12. And um, uh, connecting with students online more so at the K-5 level. And um, we also have utilized student data. Um, and, oh my gosh, I'm sorry, that is so distracting. Um, and so with that, I think I will kick things off um, and pass the torch on to K-2. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And before I jump into this slide on behalf of all the building leaders that are on this call and are in the district, we just wanna say thank you to Sandy. Um, that's a big announcement and we appreciate that he was in our position and has held many, many different positions in his career. And so he knows what many of us do on a daily basis. And we appreciate his support and his understanding for the last two years and I can't imagine coming into a district as an interim and being handed a global pandemic and school closures and um, all of that as somebody who's new to the district and new to the system and not familiar with anybody. So thank you, Sandy, on behalf of all of us. We really do um, appreciate your support and kindness for the last two years um, and wish you well in your next retirement, which I hope lasts longer than the 30 days of your first one. <laughs> so, thank you. Um, so let me jump um, into the slide now. So again, we thank you for giving us the um, two Wednesday mornings to make this um, plan to help build our plans up a little bit more. Um, as we've learned in the last three or four months of school, there are shades of red, right? There are shades of pink and red and they're not all gonna be the same. We're not gonna be just closed indefinitely and unexpectedly like we were in the springtime. We are seeing, you know, classrooms being quarantined, teams being quarantined or sent home for a few days, um, but not the whole district being shut down completely. So we're looking at tiers of closure here. So a short-term remote learning plan of two weeks or less. Um, we'll, we'll maintain our same schedules and our cohorts with just some slight adjustments. Um, and that would, you know, try to maintain as much of the same predictable daily routine as you would have if you were in, in school, um, if your class gets quarantined or gets sent home. Um, and then there's the longer term, right? There's things that are gonna be, there could be potential closure for more than that time. And that's a different, that's a different game for K2, especially because our kiddos are not just going home and um, 
and sitting in front of a computer, independently accessing things and, and independently finding what they need and doing what they need to do for school. They require a great deal of adult support. So kudos to all the parents and caregivers out there who are helping our kids on their remote days now, because it takes a team to get a five and six and seven year old on a computer at, at the right time, at the right place and the right Google Meets. And they are doing it and they're doing a great job. But if everybody's closed, those caregivers may change and those daycare situations may change and they may have to learn, they may have to have grandma learn something new to help with their child get on Google Meets for the first time. So we need to be patient, we need to be flexible and we need to be aware that some of this is not going to be smooth and easy and just doing the same thing they were doing in school, but at home. Um, so our tr transition plans um, do have some, some chance to learn and to grow and to be flexible and, and really um, thoughtful for the caregivers and for the helpers at home that are going to be with these kiddos, whether they're at daycare or at home. Um, but we want to provide a very predictable um, daily schedule for kids to be online live with their teachers to hear instruction and to see their classmates and um, and then uh, make sure that we have a, a really good clear system for distribution of materials and and things from each building right now our fully remote cohort c teachers have a really good system with their families of pick up and drop off of materials um, curbside distribution as we call it and we can expand that to include all the other homerooms as well. So um, we're learning a lot from our 100% cohort C teachers and how they've managed to uh, build schedules that work for kids and for adults. And that's, that's what we'll be doing. I think Jessica has the next slide. Good evening. Um, before I um, talk about this, I just wanna thank and let you know that um, Although Ann and I are speaking tonight, Kelly Mullen Martin um, definitely was uh, helping put all of this together and actually got us started on our slides and she is home under the weather. So I just wanna make sure you guys know that she sends her, um, her best and we wish her well and feeling better. Um, so when we think about a K-2 student going into a fully remote uh, learning environment, we wanted to um, make sure that we addressed the priorities um, for that. And as Ann mentioned, um, our K-2 students are just not yet independent learners and they require a great deal of adult support. Um, and in that remote environment, that support may or may not be a family member. So we also have to keep in mind that they're in a variety of settings with a varied level of support. Uh, when we talk about attendance in a remote environment for a K-2 student, as any student actually, we're not just noticing if they showed up and are present on the screen. We're paying close attention to their level of engagement. And we've been talking a, a lot with our teachers about how we maintain and increase engagement in that remote environment. And Monique spoke a little bit um, to this uh, um, earlier from the Panorama survey data. Um, our students need a variety of academic and behavioral supports, um, and this does not go away in a remote environment. In fact, this was one of the areas on our panorama survey that our staff expressed they were most concerned about. And just like we support students, we have families that need us in different and unique ways. So we wanna make sure we're staying current on those needs and responding to them um, promptly. Uh, in our full remote plans, uh, we're really hopeful that our buildings would remain open so that we can access everything that we need from curriculum to copy machines. So that materials drop off and pick up uh, that Ann mentioned that's already in place with our cohort C families uh, would be a coordinated effort school-wide and um, making sure that everybody got what they needed in a timely way. And then our Perhaps most important priority, of course, is making sure that our communications are strong with our staff, with our families, and also with each other. Um, so that um, this is our list of what's um, the most important things we want to keep in mind as we transition or if we transition to a fully remote um, learning model. And our next slide, Kelly is or whoever's navigating um, are two examples of 
what our hybrid teachers have created in the two days that we were granted to work on this. Um, so we've got a first grade sample and a second grade sample so that you can see more clearly what that day might look like for a student who is transitioning from uh, a hybrid model to a remote um, model. That is the K2 piece. So next we'll move. Leanne. Oh, oh sorry. why don't we, since Leanne has her, that's okay, Dan. Since Leanne has her hand up, um, it probably makes sense to chunk out the question. So go ahead, Leanne. Thanks. This may be applicable across all phase levels. Um, there was a conversation about a two week versus a longer term. How will we know if it's only two weeks when we go out versus could it extend? Um, I can give an example of what's happening just right now at Pleasant Hill. I mean, we have a class that's um, qu currently quarantined. Um, and so that's a less than two week situation. So that classroom um, teacher did not have a transition period of two, you know, two days to gather stuff and that kind of thing. Um, we had the conversation on Sunday afternoon and um, she emailed a schedule out to her families on Sunday night. And so it was a seamless transition into a remote setting. And that's in our minds, what we think um, would be a less than two week. It's really that close contact quarantine type situation. Thank you. So this isn't if the governor comes back on a Friday and says, "Correct, um, we're gone into this phase, we're not considering it that way. Exactly. Perfect, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Just making sure that you can hear me okay. Great. We can, Kelly. Great. Thank you. So K-5 worked really closely on um, preparing for those two half days that our staff had um, to prepare for any potential transition to fully remote um, teaching and learning. And um, I linked into this presentation the full K-5 PD slide deck in case any board members were curious as to um, all of the detail that you can browse at your leisure about um, the work that we did over the course of that full day, um, broken up into two half days. So um, the time really was valuable for, um, um, I'm sure for everybody, but particularly for K-5, it's not as simple as, um, it's not as seamless a transition as perhaps um, it is at 612 because they have a component of live streaming taking place right now. They're like very well poised to make a quick um, switch with, of course, a ton of work, um, but it's a little bit different for K-5. And so um, my portion of this evening is to give a little bit more insight as to why it's, um, it's different at the younger levels, um, building upon what my K-2 colleagues began talking about with the developmental differences in child care needs. Um, so if Kelly, you could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so on our exit slip at the end of our PD time after the first day, um, I captured all of the open response questions to the prompt, um, what are your biggest questions or needs at this time? and created that word cloud there. And so the bigger the word, um, the more frequently it was included in the response to what our staff um, needs or what kinds of questions they have. So you will see, not surprisingly, um, screaming at you from the middle in bold red, time. <laughs> time, I need more time. and. Um, we haven't yet figured out how to add more hours to the day, but we were very grateful for the time to separately um, have a moment to stop and prepare for something and spend the time on something that may never happen, right? It's, it's really hard when you're so busy working every day um, to plan for the week of, ahead to also on top of that plan for something 
in the distance that may never happen. So um, we were grateful for that time and that opportunity, but you can see what the other words are in here. And we spent the second half day trying to address what those specific needs of the staff were in those questions. And really one of their biggest questions was, okay, so if we transition to fully remote, will we maintain this cohort model or are we going to collapse the cohorts and have all of our kids be on the same exact schedule every day? And um, a little, the K2 leaders began speaking about that, that there's kind of two phases of red. And in the shorter term, like Jessica described, if there's a class or a team or a section of the building that is fully remote for 14 days due to a close contact, um, or if there's a um, designated shorter term closure, we will maintain our hybrid schedule with some slight tweaks and um, continue in the way that we are um, in the way that we're addressing learning now, except that everybody will be at home. So they'll, they'll maintain their two cohorts. And I'm gonna show you an example of that in just a minute. Um, if it's a longer term shutdown, we will shift to a schedule more like cohort C, but I'm gonna show you why this is a little bit complex. Um, Kelly, if you could open the first link, please, the grade five red hybrid with supports. So this is an example of a hybrid teacher schedule right now. Um, and so, as you know, in a hybrid model, one group of students comes on Mondays and Tuesdays, and another group of students comes on Thursdays and Fridays in person. So on Monday and Tuesday, we have our cohort A students in person. Every single day, the entire class is meeting together at the beginning of the day for morning meeting, to check in, to address their SEL needs, to um, have a mindful moment, hear the morning announcements, connect as a full class community. But then half of the students leave and address most of their learning that day asynchronously, meaning they don't follow the exact schedule, they have flexibility in how they complete their work. So if you've ever tuned into the end of a morning meeting, it sounds a little something like this. Okay, my at-home friends, now remember, what we talked about when you were in school on Friday is you have your math packet, you have your writing on Seesaw, and you're going to continue your, okay, you get the point. Um, and so they have their list of assignments, they have their planner, and they tackle it in the way that works best at home or at daycare or at grandma's with or without um, an adult there to support them. The intermediate age is really interesting because um, there's a big difference between a third grader and a fifth grader with regard to what they can independently accomplish. Um, April's nodding her head because I think she has both. <laughs> um, so there's a big difference um, between those developmental ages and the amount of support, support that they require. Um, so our at-home friends on Mondays and Tuesdays are sent off to address their work asynchronously. They have um, a couple opportunities to check back in with their teacher, but for the most part, they are following their schedule. Now, those yellow highlights that you see are um, the schedule for some at-home friends on their remote days. So the yellow highlights are kids who are at home, but they have scheduled support services during their asynchronous learning time. So they have specific times that they'll log on throughout the day to get um, perhaps social work, perhaps speech therapy, perhaps um, some OT, doing some OT exercises or literacy support or math support. Um, that breaks down to um, there are 95 students in special education who may receive um, related services. So not just at reading time, you go to reading, but you may receive those services that I just mentioned. And there are over 125 students in academic support at Wentworth um, receiving those types of services. So that's a lot of kids who are scheduled at specific times on their at-home learning days. So why we can't just say, okay, now that we are fully remote, um, this time from 9.45 to 10.45 every single day is going to be math for everyone. 
is because that would completely disrupt all of those 295 students who on their non-cohort days are receiving support services. So this took a little bit of time to figure out. It took a little frustration, a little, um, a little sweat on the part of our staff, and um, I think that we came to a pretty great compromise. So Kelly, if you would go back to the slide deck and then click on the second one, sample fully remote with support. So some of the givens are that everybody has to maintain the master schedule, but within that, and Kel, if you could just slide down a little bit so that we can see perhaps that first block, perfect. So morning meeting, that's not gonna change a bit, and everybody is going to um, tune in for the very beginning of the math lesson and um, have these structured times that staff will touch base with their class, um, but some kids are going to go off and do their asynchronous work. And that would give those students with the highlights their, their opportunity to continue attending their support services. And then the students who would have been in school are going to stay online with the teacher and have their more synchronous learning time. And so it won't be exactly that they're all doing the same thing at the same time, because guess what? That's not how it happens in regular school anyway when we're all in person together, the teacher is very rarely at the front of the room having all of the children do exactly the same thing. Um, we work in a workshop model at the K-5 level and um, students are at different places and they may come together for the beginning of the lesson, but throughout the course of the lesson, teachers are checking in with small groups and um, students are working on different things at different paces. So over the course of the week, everybody gets you know, to the same place, but they're coming at it from different pathways. So um, Kelly, if you could go back to the main slide deck. So that final bullet on this slide, and I'm sorry that this was a very long explanation, but it's, it's complex. <laughs> um, is that we will align to the master schedule, maintain the support and related services schedules, and then build in those breaks and section up the um, main courses so that um, students who it would have been their in-person days will have more um, synchronous learning time. And if it would have been your remote day, you'll have more asynchronous learning time. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So at the end of the two days, we checked back in on our outcomes, and um, this is really what Diane went over at the very beginning of this section of the slide deck. You know, these were the things that we um, sought to do to um, ground our work in that evidence from the surveys and look at our data, um, gain further clarification from our work, and capture the outcomes in the exit slip. And we wish that it was just as simple as that little picture right there, wake up, teach kids, be awesome. But it's not. Schools are really complex learning organizations. And um, there's a lot of um, devil in the details, as they say. So if you would go to the very last slide for Wentworth, these were the four things that we ended with. Some time for teachers to collaborate in their grade level teams, in their smaller planning teams, um, and with their partner teachers, they organized plans. They really thought through this schedule um, in many, many different ways and landed on um, something that we think will satisfy each of these criteria and priorities and started preparing materials. And then this final word cloud that I'll leave you with here today and stop talking so my middle school colleagues can, can have a turn here. Um, I'm wondering if you could guess, again, the larger the word, um, the greater frequency, what do you think the prompt was for this one? In teacher land, this is called giving wait time. <laughs> No one is volunteering their hand. Um, the, the prompt could have been, what, what is our focus? Oh, that's so close, so close. Great, 
Great guess. Um, it was what teachers thought their biggest strength was in transitioning to um, in transitioning to a potential fully remote learning situation. So, I mean, I guess uh, at the risk of being obnoxiously positive, our staff, um, they're tired, but they're incredible. And they'll go to the ends of the earth to, um, to make whatever is put in front of them work. So um, we're grateful for any time that you can provide us time to really plan um, like you did for this. So thank you so much. Um, and I have a lot of faith in our staff and the work that they do. So thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, we, we all always appreciate your obnoxious positivity. <laughs> Sarah has her hand up. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, Kelly. Um, you alluded to the fact that you met with your staff. Was it the entire staff or just leadership? It was everybody. It was everybody. Okay, awesome. Everybody. Cool, thanks. Over those two half days, the two half day Wednesdays when we didn't have, um, when we didn't have students. Great, thank you. Now we can't hear you, April. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm not seeing any other questions, so we can go ahead and move on to the middle school, please. Good evening. As Kelly mentioned, it is easier at the middle school level. Um, our students are just going to continue with their current class schedule. Our, we have over 100 students who are 100% remote right now. And then our cohort students, the A and B, they are remote on two of the days of the week. The one thing we will be doing is all following the same bell schedule. And we picked the current eighth grade bell schedule because the lunch is right in the middle of the day. Our seventh graders do eat lunch a little bit later. So um, we wanted to all go to one schedule. And Wednesdays will look the same. Um, our students, they all will log in at the beginning of their Google Meets. Um, there'll be a mixture of synchronous and asynchronous methods. When a teacher is out, they post the assignment on their Google Classroom. We also do want to make sure students have opportunities during that class period to work offline. Um, we do not want students on their screen all day, but Right now, oftentimes, a teacher will have their Google Meets open. Students are able to go work independently, but they can go on to the Google Meets if they have questions. Um, we will continue to take attendance at the beginning of the day during our crew meetings and also during each class. And again, the goal is still have students completing their work during the school day um, as much as we can again, to keep students off of their screens um, in the evening. And then we'll still have all of our meeting times in the schedule. So teachers will still have that collaborative time to plan their units. Um, we really appreciated the November 18th and December 2nd day. Um, we spent the morning of the 18th um, looking at our iReady data, and then the morning of December 2nd, we looked at our panorama survey data. And so we still have um, a lot of work to do to incorporate um, our, what we learned from that data. The staff um, did noticings and wonderings, and then they listed um, areas to celebrate and areas for growth. So we'll be digging into those areas for growth. Um, and we have um, committees at the middle school and we have quite a few that are geared towards either teacher social emotional learning or students. And so they will be working on some of the um, data from Panorama. Um, there was a big focus on the um, lesson planning for remote learning. and. Whether or not we go to 100% remote learning, those, the, the planning they did can be implemented in the hybrid model also. 
So they really, they went back again and they did this at the beginning of the year, you know, looking at the curriculum and looking at what do they really need to cover this year? What's the essential learning? Taking those recommendations from the K-12 curriculum um, committee and then incorporating the remote learning best practices into the lesson plans. You know, teachers have the distance learning playbook um, as a resource, and we also have a book study going on um, for optional for teachers who have joined that. And, you know, planning for that remote assessments was something else. And there was a lot of other work, you know, looking at technology and looking at pieces, but it was very valuable. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Nope, I'm not seeing any hands, Kathy. Thank you. So at the high school, um, first I, I would just, I would like to do two quick things. One is congratulate Sandy, and I'll leave it at that, but congratulations. And um, at the high school level, I just want to thank all of, of the building for the work they're doing. Teachers um, and staff here are working so hard to meet every need for the students. And our students have just been incredible in their um, efforts. They are making the best of tough situations. They are just doing remarkably well. And I just want to thank everyone. At the high school, we began this summer planning a schedule with eyes in mind of being able to go from green to yellow to red lanes. Um, and our plan encompassed that from the beginning. So our teachers um, at the high school have been teaching in multi-strains every day, all day uh, this year. In that every period they have students in front of them that are working um, in person that day. They have students that are having their non-in-person days and they have students in class that are fully remote. So our staff has really been um, doing all of this work every period in multi-modes. And um, But the good news is that for the high school, if we were to go fully remote, our schedule would remain initially the same. Like um, Kathy mentioned, we would, instead of having three different lunch times, which we get to do to feed a thousand students or 500 in, um, in distance learning, but um, we would just do block one, block two in their advisory time in the morning, and then we would all have lunch and then we'd come back for the other two blocks. The only other change we, we've talked about making and, and our instructional leadership team has been talking about this is if we were to go to a longer term, um, fully remote than a week or two weeks, um, we would look at going back to the handbook for the schedule because this is set up um, with red day one and, red, and white day one all week so that both cohorts get the red day one and the white day one. Um, that really speaks to our science and our math classes that have labs. And it refers to when they have a double class and when they have a single class. And if we did go fully remote for a longer period of time, we would be able to go back to having, um, having it follow our handbook because we wouldn't need to replicate the lab time each week or not each week for the different cohorts. So that is one um, small change we would make other than having lunch at the same time. Um, I also wanted to just highlight on this slide that our A East and advisory time is still in this schedule. We are still utilizing that 35 minutes a day for teachers and students to be able to connect for extra help, make up a quiz, ask a question about last night's homework, and that continues in the fully remote model, um, as well as our um, monthly advisory meetings would, um, twice a month advisory meetings would continue as well. We've left that time in there. 
Um, for the next slide, our expectations for students really remain um, essentially the same. Our students, whether in person or remote, are expected to report to all classes for attendance and directions. That includes study halls and their AEST advisory. They do this through Google Meets. Um, when they are fully remote, we do try to plan time in the period where they don't have to be on the screen, but the teacher is still available. They can get back on and ask a question um, and um, move along that way. They will attend classes remotely and follow class procedures and expectations set by the teacher. For teachers, they will just be teaching, um, instead of having two strains of students, students in front of them and remote to teach every period, everyone, they really, um, it'll be a little bit more um, workable for them because everyone will be remote and they'll have one audience again. Um, and also, uh, we will still be continuing with all our extra meetings, after school department meetings, faculty meetings, teacher design time, 504's IEP, Wednesday professional development, the instructional leadership team, all of those meetings will still be occurring. We'll just be doing them fully remote um, in a virtual manner. Um, I also just wanted to talk a little bit about what other, what our non-instructional teachers, what other people would be doing. Um, our special education ed techs, many of them are working directly with students in a study hall setting, and they would continue to do that work virtually. Um, many of our um, special ed ed techs are teaching small groups at the level one um, level, and they would continue um, doing instruction with students and coursework. Our Learning Commons ed techs will be supporting any work um, through remote operations of students with their class have research to do, they could. They would still be working on that. And our two ed techs in the Learning Commons this year have been very adaptive and helpful going into classes and doing some subbing, um, running some study halls, and we would still be tagging them for some of that work on an as needed basis. Our building ed techs would be used um, as needed doing classroom sub work, which they pitch hit daily on. They would be supporting building needs here and remote operations. And Mr. Combs would still be keeping his daily connection with our CTE vocational students and keeping them connected and supported as well. Our administrative assistants in the building would continue work either in the building or remotely dependent on the circumstances and what is currently allowed. Our goal will be to be here in the building um, for operations unless we are really told we cannot be in the building. Our long-term um, supplemental subs that are in class daily, um, supporting our teachers that are teaching remotely, um, we have a plan that we would team hit with Allison and the special ed department. If she had some holes that needed to be filled, they might, need, they might get to be reassigned to help there. And also some of them would likely help us with our daily sub work needing um, coverage. If someone had to take a sick day, even though we were remote, they would be helping with that. So we really do have plans for all of our support staff and how they would be working with us and helping us. And we're really pleased that we will be able to support Allison um, and some of her needs as well. We're, happy to be able to do that. So that's the high school's plan. So just to kind of wrap things up, um, one last piece that we wanted to talk about is um, obviously when we had to pivot in March, um, none of these pieces were in place. And I am just amazed by all of the work that, that each one of these leaders that you've heard from has put in with their staffs um, to, to be able to get things to the level that they are. Um, also want to just make you aware that we understand that there are many other people in our organization and we have really tried to um, pay attention to 
planning what their roles might look like in a in a fully remote environment. If if the governor had a stay at home order, um, for example, as we did in March. And so uh, this slide here just details that a little bit. Um, in terms of our nursing staff, uh, just as they did this spring, they would still be available to support student medical needs. Um, they have a lot of students that they see on a regular basis for a number of things. And um, this spring, they worked really hard to connect with all of those families and and keep that moving forward as well as, you know, they were um, the girls on the ground getting all the information um, in regards to the changing mandates and the requirements with the state for COVID. Um, our academic support staff um, in all of our schools, um, even our study center folks at the high school would continue to offer academic supports for students. Again, they would just be remote. Um, folks in student services, like our school counselors and our social workers, would still be available to meet with individuals and small groups of students. Um, our food services folks would um, be engaged in um, delivering meals and making food available. Uh, they have been outstanding. I know that um, especially with the flexibility in um, the feeding program this year and the fact that all families can access um, breakfast and lunch every day, our food services staff are, are busier than ever. And um, that would still be available to everyone in a fully remote environment. Our transportation department um, this spring, they became kind of um, our wheels in Scarborough, and um, we would again look to them to um, deliver some of these meals, to deliver materials to students as needed. Um, and so uh, that is with in our plan. And our IT department, wow, um, can we just say how tirelessly they have worked as well and if we went to a fully remote environment, um, I am sure the help desk tickets and the request for tech help would continue. Um, and so um, again, I think that we have just tried to take a, a real organizational view of um, digging into what a red environment could look like. And so hopefully um, this helps to paint that picture for all of you now. As much gratitude as everyone expressed for having that time, um, I think the board is equally grateful that you all were able to come and present to us tonight, just, and to the community, um, because you just, like you just said, Diane, this is an organizational effort. Um, we're all in this together and the more information we have and the more on the same page we can be, hopefully that leads to greater success as an organization. And so thank you all so much for preparing these slides and, and giving your time tonight. I'm not seeing any hands, so I think we'll move on to agenda item 6.3, which is our winter athletics update. don't know. I'm promoting you right now, um, Mike. Hello. Great. Hi, Mike. So um, let me first say on behalf of the Athletics and Activities Department, I want to congratulate Sandy and and uh, thank him for um, all his support these last two years. It's, it's been, uh, it's really been tremendous. We appreciate that. Um, let me first start out, if you go to the first slide, um, with a little bit of background on activities first. There's a lot on that slide, um, but I want to uh, certainly talk about, you know, that side of, of what we do as well. 
Um, we're real excited about everything that's happening with activities. Most all the club programs are happening. This is not everything. This is just a snapshot at some things. Uh, Oak Hill Players is, is actually doing their performance. Um, it's called High School Zoomsical. Um, it's a, a remote production and they're working real hard on it and, and hopefully we'll have something pulled together um, to be able to show remotely um, at, the end of, at the end of January. Um, One Act Play has just decided that they're gonna start. They got word from the Maine Principal Association, as you, must, as you might know, the One Act Play is a uh, part of the Maine Principals Association. It's a competition format. Um, they're going to pick up uh, doing an activity um, and that's, that gives a little description there about what they're doing. Key Club has continued on with their things, understanding that um, in a COVID environment, watching their distancing and things like that, but still engaging in community service projects and, and things of that nature. Um, ECOS has a new club advisor, Mrs. Zavaznik, and um, we're glad to have her on board and helping out with that program. Um, they have started their recycling and working in their garden and meeting and um, just, you know, doing a great job. Student Council, and that happens to be a picture right there of the Student Council project that just finished an activity for Project Grace. Um, so they're, they're really engaged. And as you can see, um, you can go down through and see all the different things that are happening. National Honor Society is doing their ceremony, but it was pushed to into February. Um, jazz Band is only going with one group this year instead of Jazz Band 1 and Jazz Band 2. Um, but they had enough students to do that. Some things will be in person, obviously not wind instruments, but um, some of their things will be in person. Some of them will be remotely. And our club, I'll just thank um, Aaron Landry Fowler for volunteering her time to get the art club back going. Um, as you know, our club was a program that we had um, many, many years ago. It was cut from the budget. Um, Aaron um, has started that back up on a volunteer basis um, and, and will be doing some things remotely and what she can do with things in person. Same with middle school. We've been meeting with all the middle school advisors. Um, so it's the same type of explanation there. A lot, of, lot more virtual, a lot more remote things at the middle school. I will tell you that um, Diane, who's our theater director at the middle school, did find a show um, to do for middle school. It's called The Show Must Go Online. It was actually written for this COVID environment. Um, and so it was a great opportunity for uh, those kids to continue on and the scripts are all built around doing it virtually and remotely so um, that should end up being a great production. I'll also just point out uh, to one thing that I glanced at was we do have a new advisor with speech and debate Dave Pay, one of our new employees here as well and he's just doing a super job with the competitions for that quite a few kids involved in that and they're you know doing their uh, I think they have eight or 10 virtual competitions that they're, they're doing this year. So we'll go on from there. And in terms of athletics, this is the uh, timeline that's kind of been laid out, the similar sort of thing I shared with you in the fall. So this lays out how things progressed with winter sports. Um, depending on what happens tomorrow and what we find out tomorrow, uh, we will be looking to start on Monday. Um, this week, we did our call out meetings with all the students. And in fact, as you know, we did that in the fall and that was just something that we decided to do. Uh, this winter though, it ended up becoming a mandatory MPA activity. So we had to do the call out meetings. Fortunately, we we're ahead of that because we had already started doing that fall in the fall. So it was just part of our normal routine. Um, so we've been doing those this week. We wrapped up the last ones actually just before this meeting. And so um, all the kids are good to go with that. I'm gonna have Jordan come on too. Uh, hopefully um, somebody promoted Jordan because Jordan is part of our presentation tonight as well. And he's going to you know, do the next couple slides. Yep, I'm here. Can everybody hear me all right? Um, we can. Well, Thanks for having me. Um, I know I don't, I haven't met everybody here in person, but it's, it's a pleasure to meet you all from afar. 
um, these next two slides is, are really information that um, derives from the community sport guidelines that were put out from the state. Um, those were put out, um, you might remember, in the fall, and then they, they adjusted it a little bit um, in the beginning of November. So a few changes here. Um, the, the, the definitions of the low moderate risk really haven't changed much. Um, and you'll see on the next slide, what really has changed is the level of allowable activities that fall within those, um, those risk levels. But you can see here, we've listed our, our winter um, teams here and their risk level. Um, unfortunately, the, the only higher risk sport um, was, was the sport of wrestling. <clears throat> and one sport that you, you don't see here that will be brought up a little bit later um, because of the, the, the date change um, and the start is volleyball. Um, and as you know from the fall, volleyball was a moderate risk sport, but because of the, the indoors um, aspect of it, um, we're not able to compete in the fall um, simply because the allowable activity um, didn't allow for such. So um, if we go to the next slide, Kelly, we can jump right in. So this is a kind of a, a spreadsheet uh, matrix that Mike and I had developed. It's really what um, lies within the community sport guidelines, but we tried to present it in a way that was a lot easier for, for students, families, and, and our coaches to read. Um, so you can see it, it lists every sport here. Um, and the, the winter season is really um, spread out between three time periods. Um, so like Mike mentioned, hopefully if all goes well, uh, Monday, December 7th will be really our, our first go at it. And um, during that, that phase, um, teams cannot perform any competition type drills. Um, they can only do skill, um, skill building drills and conditioning type drills, um, as well as being distant from each other. And then when we get into the December 14th, things kind of start to um, get a little more normalized, if you would, um, in terms of the sport. Now with wrestling, um, obviously they're only allowed to go up to level two, um, which is they can get together in teams, um, but they have to remain six feet apart at all time. And, and Mike might mention this later, but our plan with them right now is to give them access to the weight room um, when they need it so that they are able to get together as a team and, and still still do, do something. Um, that's the sport of wrestling. Um, like I mentioned with volleyball, the NPA has agreed to, to move the competitive season um, to hopefully start in February. And we'll talk a little bit about that more um, later in the later slides. I'll just, I'll just add to while we're on this slide that um, our goal in Scarborough has been to to provide some experience for every program and every student that wants to participate in each program. So although wrestling is going to be um, not traditional, um, we did want to provide an opportunity for those uh, student athletes to connect with coaches and be able to do something. Same true with indoor track. Uh, indoor track certainly, as you can imagine, would be a challenge to do. Um, the traditional meets and, and tournaments, but we want to provide that opportunity to our student athletes. Um, really the toughest ones, and we'll talk about this a little later, is, is ice hockey and swimming because of facility related issues. But we really, um, not every school is doing that, but we really want to provide an opportunity for all our students to be engaged um, in some after school activity because we understand um, the value of that, certainly. Um, and I know you do as well, understand the value of connectedness to school um, through activities beyond the classroom. We can go to the next slide there. Um, and this is um, about what, things that we've done to reduce risk. Some of them um, you saw in the, in the fall, those, those types of things continue. I know Todd is and his staff is working really, really hard on um, filtration systems and things of that nature. 
those all benefit our program certainly because now we've moved inside. Um, so of course the rules change a little bit inside with athletics and activities, but um, the, the things that are happening around us are really helpful as well. Um, and also, uh, like I mentioned too, um, although our coaches and student athletes participated in our workshops this week, our coaches are required to attend several um, workshops. Uh, one of them, our annual uh, seasonal coaches mandatory workshop, um, where we go over COVID things as well as uh, general um, guidelines that we want them to follow. And as part of their training requirements, as you, as you know, coaches have to take about eight or 10 courses to be um, considered a certified high school coach. And so part of that new requirement is also an online uh, COVID course for coaches that um, is a requirement as well. We can continue on. Um, and then these continue to be our goals. Um, we're pretty focused on that. Um, whether we're remote or whether we're in person, we'll continue um, to strive to make those connections with our student athletes. Um, all of our coaches now have set up Google Classrooms um, to be able to communicate with our students as well if we happen to be remote. And so um, they've all found those kind of electronic ways to, um, you know, continue to stay connected. Jordan has been a great support in, uh, you know, helping the coaches, uh, especially the ones that are a little more technically challenged um, to get all those systems set up so that um, they can, um, they'll be able to continue to communicate no matter what environment we're in. We can continue on to the next slide, I think. Um, these are some of the things that our league has done. Certainly we um, continue to meet as a league um, we're developing schedules in the, in the winter time. Um, they will be very much like the fall. There'll be um, those sports that can play games will be set up in a pod system. For the most part, we'll stay within our county. There is some crossover in counties and some sports, but for the most part, we're in our county and they're small pods. Um, and we, 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 all the teams that can play games are playing about two thirds of their normal schedule. So um, basketball, for example, if it had 18 games, we're going to play about 12 games. Uh, the season does officially come to an end at the end of February, but they've reserved the first two weeks in March um, for winter sports to be able to continue and offer uh, some type of postseason if they want to. It won't be anything statewide. Um, it would be within your own pod if you want to put together, you know, a little tournament. Um, no trophies, no awards, no things like that, but um, it would be an opportunity to have a little bit an end of the season kind of competition to wrap things up. Jordan did speak a little bit about what they referred to as that wedge season. And so we're beginning to, although we've been very focused on just trying to get the winter started, um, we are beginning to think about how do we manage uh, the facility needs for volleyball while winter sports are still happening. Uh, so that's going to that's gonna be a bit of a challenge um, to add in volleyball indoors while winter sports is still happening. Um, but we're going to, you know, work through that. There may be some later evening practices, but we'll work through that. Um, on the football front, I'll just bring, bring us back around because you had mentioned volleyball from the fall. So we'll mention football also from the fall. Is There is a, um, a plan out there right now that looks at having a football season, that a normal football season that would start in May and run through July. I don't know how much traction that will get, um, especially when you think about um, the concern that if we're back to somewhat of, of a normal situation next season, next year, um, we're gonna be ending football in July and looking to start the next football season in August. 
I don't know um, if that makes sense. And so that that's going to be looked at a little bit harder, but there is a proposal out out there um, with the Football Coaches Association that they're pres they're bringing forward um, to take a look at. So that's kind of what's happening there. I think we can move on to the next one. You know, some of our roadblocks and really probably the biggest one is um, facility related. As you can imagine, um, our primary facility for hockey was uh, USM. USM is not going to allow outside groups onto their campus, even during the time when student F, when their students are not there. Um, so most of the colleges have shut down, which closed a lot of rinks. Um, the Civic Center was also the second place that we used for hockey, and they're looking not to put their ice in. And so it really shuts us down with the hockey program. I, I was able to secure some ice um, at the, the rink in Portland, Trobe Ice Arena, and I have covered uh, ice uh, through January 2nd. I have no game ice and I have no ice beyond January 2nd. Um, so hockey is going to be a challenge this year and um, mostly related to facilities, um, but they're moving forward with trying to do a program. We're not alone. In fact, I think that we're, we're better off than some schools are even. Um, there are schools such as South Portland and Cape that um, have no ice now because they completely relied on the Civic Center um, for their ice. So um, we're still in talks with the Civic Center. We've reached out to over 15 ranks. Um, we have some communication uh, going with some ranks to try to get some other ice, but that's a big challenge. Uh, Cape Pool has remained open and has kept us um, in their loop of allowing uh, schools to participate there. So um, fortunately, we don't have the problem of pools like some schools do. Many YMCA's shut their pools down to non-members. And so a lot of schools that use Ys, for example, are struggling to figure out how they're gonna do a swim program. We're fortunate that we don't have to do that. The, the struggle with pool time is that we're only allowed 18 people uh, 18 students plus the two coaches, 18 students in the pool area at any one time. We have a large uh, swim program. And so just trying to continue to figure out what strategize ways to, you know, accommodate everybody so that we don't have to do something like have cuts in a sport that we didn't normally have cuts in. Um, We've also been trying to, you know, work with Todd Gibson and some of the other uh, building principals uh, on use of the school facilities. Uh, Kelly Crosby has been very helpful. Um, and, and also, you know, certainly Todd, uh, because we're really trying to minimize students in the common spaces. Um, in, in the past, for example, with track, track, there's so many students and so many activities use three different facilities um, to be able to have practice. And so, of course, we can't use the middle school because middle school sports is going to happen, actually. They are going to have a basketball season. And so we, because of how many students were allowed um, in one space at any one time, we wouldn't be able to have high school using the middle school anymore while middle school was using it. Um, we also are trying to minimize students, for example, running in the hallways because it just means more sanitization for the athletic trainers, excuse me, for the uh, custodians. So, uh, you know, we're really trying to, uh, you know, work through all those facility issues. Just, just, um, that's just been a real challenge, um, you know, to do. And you can see some of the rest of the things that we have on there. As you know, yellow is red for us. Um, and so we're keeping our fingers crossed for tomorrow. There is a pause, there is some scuttlebutt about um, the possibility that even if we're in green, the, the commissioner, Commissioner Lambro may decide to still not allow um, 
sports, community sports and um, school sports to happen um, only because of, you know, such a high rate in the COVID number. I, w I am happy to report though that our fall season saw no stoppages because of COVID. Um, not every school could say that, but we, we were able to finish the entire season and not really have any impact from COVID. Um, and I think that speaks to the, you know, the good work of our kids, you know, doing the right thing, the good work of our coaches, um, doing the right thing and the systems that we have in place as well. Um, so booster funding is another area that we're struggling with, as you can imagine, um, you know, boosters continue to pick up those costs that um, the budget doesn't cover anymore. Um, most recently is uniforms, for example, that was cut from the budget. And so boosters have helped pick that up, although booster funding and booster fundraising is a real struggle in a COVID environment. For example, the basketball boosters major fundraiser was the Christmas tournament. And so that's not going to happen this year. And so they're trying to, you know, strategize about other ways for fundraising. And our boosters have been wonderful in coming up with creative ways to, you know, raise funds, doing things remotely, all, you know, all the things that they have to do to, to try to do that. But they're certainly not going to um, raise the money that they've raised in the past. So what, we are concerned about that moving forward. Um, and we've, um, you know, we've spent some time talking about um, the groups being very frugal about their spending this year and really scrutinizing um, each dollar. Because as we told them, um, you know, we may come back to you and need to you know, look at covering more essential components of programs, depending on how budgets go. I'm really concerned about that moving forward because of the lack of the ability to do the same type of fundraising that we've done um, in the past. We'll go on to the next slide and Jordan will pick it up again. We're ready, yep. Um, so here, here's just a quick look at, at where we stand in terms of um, registrations, um, student athletes registered for the winter, both middle school and high school. Um, I, I would, I think Mike and I would fully um, anticipate both of these numbers to go up. Um, it's not unusual that we have many, many registrations come in the, the weekend before we start. Um, and actually, as of since Tuesday, um, the high school number has, has jumped up about 15 or so. Um, so, you know, we are, we're in a good place right now um, in terms of registrations. And, I, and I, I would fully anticipate those to keep climbing as we get closer and closer to Monday. Um, where do we go from here? So, you know, our department is, um, really, um, just going to continue to do our best to, to communicate all this information. Um, if, if you've seen the, the website and, um, seen the documents that we've, we've put out, it, it's a, it's a ton of information, um, and it, and it can get overwhelming. And so we're doing our best to send that out as, as often, um, as we get it. And, um, you know, we're just going to continue to do so. Um, as, as far as middle school, um, actually yesterday, um, we had sent out a brief letter through Swift Reach uh, to seventh and eighth grade families, um, explaining that in the middle of November, the middle school athletic conference had voted to hold off until January 11th to start the competitive winter one season. Um, winter one season at the middle school is really just the sport of basketball. Um, there currently has been no talks about the winter two season um, in depth, which is um, the middle school sports of swimming, wrestling, and indoor track. And like Mike had mentioned with the high school, um, the reason there's no real information regarding those at the middle school level is is really due to facility issues. Um, 
you know, with the struggles of the high school teams trying to get into those facilities, it's, it's going to make it uh, very, very difficult for middle school um, to, to use those as well. So um, the, the winter two season is, um, is really still a wait and see. Um, but January 11th is our, is our planned start date for um, the middle school basketball season. So, um, so we'll, we'll get ready for that. And then, you know, Mike had mentioned already a little bit about the wedge season. So this wedge season, um, as of right now, I think the date really is February 22nd. So um, the volleyball committee, um, you know, voted to, to do a competitive volleyball season starting February 22nd. Um, there'll be two weeks of a, of a preseason for those students that um, wouldn't currently be, be doing a winter sport. And then games would pick up two weeks later, um, March 8th. And then I believe that's the plan right now for um, the Unified Basketball Program. Um, they're still working on that bulletin um, and what that season will look like. It's gonna be a little bit different um, like most things are right now. Um, and then wrestling, um, the MPA wrestling committee did um, vote to push back the competitive start date to, to February 26th. Um, obviously with that said, the community sport guidelines would still have to change for us to, to make that a go, but um, we're still hopeful. So, um, and then, you know, like, like everybody's doing in our buildings is just to continue to try and to make all of our safety measures um, the best that they can be. And um, I think that we're constantly doing that. So that's, that's really what we've got. Questions? We have a couple of questions. Um... Leanne, why don't you go first, please? Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation. This was great, incredibly thorough. Um, just wondering if we're going to have shortened seasons where there will be um, less costs for busing or less costs with um, refs, is there, an, is there an opportunity to help the boosters? Because it really has been impossible to try to fundraise this season um, in helping to fund uniforms or any of the events that they may be putting on? I think in some cases there are, unfortunately, um, doing things the way we've doing them have come with a cost as well. And so, um, so we've had to, um, we were able to secure some COVID money for the, some things that we needed working with Kate, but um, some of the additional expenses have also come out of our budget. Um, we've certainly needed to use more game support um, because uh, all the COVID rules with sanitizing equipment um, at breaks during the games and things of that nature. So um, there's been some other costs associated with um, doing sports and athletics, but we certainly do help where we can. Um, I don't think uniforms is one of those places that we could help. It's just such a big number. Um, and, but, um, you know, we're helping, we're helping where we can um, with budget items, but we have incurred additional expenses um, just to be able to put on the programs that we're doing. Okay. Thank you. But live, live streaming, live streaming alone is an increase. Um, live streaming every single event for example. Nick, go ahead. Am I unmuted? There we yeah. go. All right. <clears throat> I just wanted to say, like Leanne did, I just wanted to say thank you for this presentation and for all the presentations. I didn't want another one to go by without someone saying something, so that's why I threw my hand up quick. But I also wanted to just say, I'm, I'm still thinking about, because this is who I am, I'm still thinking about Monique's presentation. I'm thinking about those social emotional learning numbers and the, the community engagement numbers. And 
if you guys weren't working so hard to think out of the box and individually examine all these athletic activities and groups and clubs, we wouldn't have even the level of engagement, you know, between our students in this unusual situation that we do. So thank you for continuing to keep your eye on this and keep as many opportunities open for our students as possible. Thanks. I appreciate that, Dr. Gill, because we were, so I was at, we were actually surprised that our numbers are in line um, with what they've been. So as you, as you know from previous presentations, um, our participation rate in after school activities, school sanctioned after school activities is in, is about 90%. And so that, um, you know, we understand the value of that, of that connectedness and understand the value of students involved in after school activities. And we're so grateful and proud, frankly, of, um, you know, being able to provide these services. It, it is a ton of work. It's, it, as everybody said, it's not double the work. It's really 10 times the work. And it's, and it's really because of having to be in the weeds of every little thing. You know, a media person wants to come to a game and it's, you know, it's, it's 10 things you have to do. Um, so um, it is a lot of work, but um, it's, uh, you know, to see the kids and see their happiness and, and being engaged is, um, and, and, and understanding the value of that engagement is certainly worth that. So thank you for saying that. We really appreciate it. Very well said, Nick, thank you. And to all of our presenters tonight, Mike and Jordan, thank you for giving us so, so much detail and putting so much time and thought into what you were able to present to us tonight. Um, we are so lucky to have so many people who are dedicated to putting our kids first all the time. So thank you to everybody who um, presented to us tonight. Moving on to uh, agenda item 7.0 is the chair's report. Um, before I present my slide, I, I also want to say thank you to Sandy. Um, I know that he does not want attention brought to him or to his announcement, but you know, we can't let the moment go by without saying thank you. This is not the year or year and a half, two years that you signed up for, Sandy. Um, and your kind and calm demeanor has been an asset to us all. So thank you very much. Thank you. For, for my chair's report tonight, uh, the first thing I wanted to present to the board was um, a breakdown of where we're at with the equity steering committee process. Um, I created this graphic and hope it looks like a lot, but hopefully uh, it is readable. It, it reads um, right to left, right? So, so, so just, just bear with me here for a second. So we, Shannon and I uh, had the opportunity to do a call after our last meeting. So the first little bubble there represents our last meeting where we voted um, to allow MAEC, which is the main, nope, Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, um, to enter into an MOU with Scarborough Public Schools. After that meeting, Shannon and I had the opportunity to do a call um, with our liaison from MAEC just to give us the kind of next steps and to walk us through what the process was going to be um, I think Shannon and I both probably took two and a half or three pages of notes apiece. Um, she is a wealth of information. She answers all of our questions um, with grace. And so I feel really great about this partnership. Um, what we need to do as a board is outlined across the top of the graphic and work that's going to be taking place with our district, within the district and with our staff is outlined along the bottom of the graphic. So across the top, December 3rd is today. Um, later on in our agenda, we have an action item to authorize the communications committee to solicit applicants for an equity steering committee. This is my recommendation for how we should move forward. And once I've kind of gone through my presentation, I'm certainly open to questions. 
Um, when we formed the building steering committee a year ago, in order to form the building steering committee, we tasked the long range planning committee with soliciting those applicants. And so for me, I kind of went back to that same model and said, what's the best way to do this at a committee level so that we can move a little more quickly than when we all have to meet as a full board? Um, because I don't think that all of these decisions need to be full board decisions. To me, the communications and outreach Tech, technically, it's the Communications and Outreach Task Force is the full name of that committee, um, is a logical fit for soliciting these kind of um, applicants. So we'll, we can discuss that further. Like I said, it's an action item later on in our agenda. Um, if we do pursue this path, then the Communications Committee will have the opportunity to meet with MAEC um, in order to help them to develop uh, what the application should look like, what kind of questions to ask so that we solicit um, a broad base of volunteers who are willing to give their time to this committee. Um, after they've done that, the communications committee would come back to the board um, and give us their recommendations. We can go into executive session to review the applications and decide how many members we would like on the committee and choose the committee um, in executive session. And then we would come back to public session and the board would vote to form the equity steering committee based on the discussion that we had as a group in, in executive session. Along the bottom, while the board is taking this process and following through with the necessary steps for the process, during the month of December, the MAEC would be able to consult with and arrange for a climate survey and an equity audit to take place within our schools. Both of those tasks are staff facilitated. Um, and so one of the things that we kind of spent our phone call talking about and wrapping our heads around was what the board's role is in this process versus what the staff's role is you know, in this process. And so the, the staff would have, um, you know, the task of um, organizing and figuring out the best way to initiate the climate survey and the equity audits at the building level. And again, MAEC had plenty of suggestions um, and guidance that our staff could use. Uh, the staff will then gather the data. The data is then sent to MAEC to be analyzed and compounded and whatever it is that they do to put it into a report. And that data would be presented to our equity steering committee, at which time they can solicit more data, they can ask questions, um, they can brainstorm next steps. And that's the point when that committee really gets into the meat of what's going on in our schools and where we want to go next so that they can come back to the board and say, this is the work that was done. These are the results that were found. These are the next steps that we would like to see the district take. And so that's kind of, you know, my 300 foot view of, of how this um, process should probably play out. So I have questions. Looks good, Ava. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so as I mentioned, to tie this up, um, later on I have wording prepared for a motion um, under action items for us to authorize the communication committee to solicit the applicants for the equity steering committee. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Thank you, Kelly. The only other bit of business that I wanted to share with the board is that I'm hoping to schedule a retreat. Um, the retreat is separate from the workshop that we need to do. So there are two things we, that we have going on. We need to do a workshop to review our board goals, um, but that typically takes place during one of our regularly scheduled workshop times. And we can look at the calendar um, and Sandy and I and Diane can discuss when logically that makes sense to use that workshop time. Um, but this is something separate. 
we did this the first year that I was on the board, but then because last year we had such uh, a disruption and COVID um, crisis happening that we didn't do a retreat. Um, but I would like to make this a priority for the board. Um, some of the proposed agenda items that I would like to discuss, I would like to review the operating protocols. There are 12 operating protocols currently posted publicly on our webpage. And just give those a once over and make sure that that's something that we all still um, believe in as a board. I'd like to update and consolidate the liaison roles. As I said, when I was assigning them, there's a lot of redundancy there. Um, some of the committees don't exist anymore. And so I think that just needs to be cleaned up. Um, review committee charges. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, the curriculum committee doesn't have um, a formal written charge. And then last but not least, um, this is a concern that I've heard from a couple of different people over the past year or so, um, nothing new, um, but just that we define our roles, responsibilities, and expectations of our committee chairs and our liaison. Um, and so just to have that discussion all as a group, I think would be really beneficial for us. I'm hoping that we can find a way to do this in public. I'm um, sorry, not in public. All of our meetings are in public, in person. Um, obviously with spacing, um, you know, hopefully if it was the board and we, and we could get a room that was big enough, um, if we could have chambers A and B, for example, um, just so that we could see each other and connect. I think that would be really beneficial for us all. Um, and so stay tuned for a doodle poll um, and I'll try and get that scheduled for January. And also um, I'm certainly open to other agenda items and suggestions um, for that retreat. Questions? Would student reps be included in that? Absolutely, Max. Cool. Yep, good question. Okay, I think we can move on. Agenda item 8.0 is committee reports. All right, um, communication. communication. Sorry, communications had its first meeting uh, this past week. And we started building kind of some foundational um, pieces really looking at the various modes and there's a lot more than I think we recognized until we started getting them on paper um, and looking at who the target audience is for each of those modes. So if we're looking at the newsletter, who is that going to? And then we're also working through um, what is the timeline to post to them? So if we wanted to get something into the leader, if we wanted it in the newsletter, um, when do we need to get that information in in order to meet deadlines? So we're working through that we're also trying to build out a timeline for 2021 communications because there's a lot. And in order to get ahead of some of this, what I'm asking for is if all the committee chairs could send over potential topics that you believe are going to come out of your committees for this year. And if you have any timelines, even if they're just rough, if you could share that with us and we will start plugging that in so that we can come back and we can start showing, I just sort of see a little model this on the bottom, um, we can start looking at what sort of communications will come out in January, what's coming out in February, so that we can make sure that we're targeting the right things at the right times, because a lot of this is going to overlap. And we just want to make sure that we're being really clear on the messages and the messaging that we're sending out to the community and nothing gets lost along the way. Um, in preparation and expectation of the work and the equity piece, we've scheduled two more meetings. We've got one this coming Monday and one on the 14th, both at 11 o'clock. Um, so we'll be able to really get a lot of work underway and ready to start rolling in the month of December. Um, I did borrow from the previous committee's stay in touch information, just to make sure that folks know, email us at boe at scarboroughschools.org. If you have public comments and you can't join the Zoom, we have a link there. And then reminders that we're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Took me just a hot second there to get it out. That's all I have. Thanks, Leanne. Negotiations? Yes, um, I have two things to update on. Um, 
actually three, one's not on here because it just happened earlier today, but um, all of the MOUs, all six, six of them, all six of them have been signed, ratified, and are posted on the SPS website. So we can finally put a big ink check mark in that for now. Uh, on the horizon, um, there are three CBAs that are due to expire on June 30th, 2021. I actually originally thought there were four, but I was reminded today in a conversation that our first conversation is negotiations that the administrator contract actually has been extended for another year. So that brings us from four to three, which is actually good news because three contracts is a lot. Um, so the ESP contract, the bus driver's contract, and the custodian's slash food service contract will all um, come due in June. And so I would expect the process to begin probably after the holidays um, to start having conversations about building new contracts for those groups. Um, the negotiations team, the new team did meet for the first time today, just to kind of have an orientation to talk a little bit about the process, how the process can be initiated, uh, and to go over one of the documents from MSMA that came out of a conference we recently attended virtually, which is the ABCs of collective bargaining, talking about the different things that are subject to bargaining, the things that aren't, and everything that lives in between. So we had a great conversation. Uh, I think it's going to be a very strong team, and uh, we have a work cut out for us for sure. Alicia, would you like to add something? I would just, thank you for that, Nick. Would you mind just um, explaining your acronyms for the public in case they don't know or haven't heard? I know you've explained them before. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, you, you do this for a couple of years and you start to live in acronym world. Um, CBAs are collective bargaining agreements. Uh, the MOUs are memorandums of understanding. Uh, ESP is educational support professionals, which includes ed techs, clerks, admin assistants, LPNs. I think there's another couple groups in there. Uh, secretaries are in there. I think that's all of them. Thank you, Nick. Yep. Finance committee. Cool, guys. It's that time again. Budget development season is upon us. So our first meeting is um, next week um with the new committee and that's really it but april if it's okay i'll use this time just to give a quick town council liaison update sure absolutely cool so just uh really quickly the i think the main thing for everyone to be aware of um i think this is an action on all of us but it mostly sits with the long range planning committee um is the town is undergoing a review of the comprehensive plan. Um, it's something that's been happening for the last couple of weeks. And I think a, the workshop, there's, the town council is having a workshop on December 10th. Um, the town council liaison, John, mentioned to me that there's a section in the comprehensive plan that relates to schools and enrollment. And some of the data might be a little bit out of date. Um, and some of the plans in there might also be a little out of date. So his recommendation was just that we review it. Um, and if we have any feedback, we want to modify it in any way that we pr provide that information to John, and then he will then sort of relay that on to the rest of the group. So I think I spoke to Kristen, and I think maybe we'll pick this up as part of long range, but everyone has access to that plan and, and can have a look at it themselves. That's it. Excellent, Sarah. Thank you. Before we move on to student reports, um, I need a motion to extend our meeting beyond 9.30. So moved. Second. And Diane, could you call a vote, please? Yes. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Tazalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Kelly, you can go on to the next slide, please. Awesome. So, Ms. Relicage talked about this earlier, but I'm going to say it again because I'm in this. So as a lot of you know, I do OCO Players. And um, so basically our director over the summer, she went to a lot of these like uh, sessions where she learned about this new kind of theater that's being piloted in the face of the global pandemic. And we're basically um, 
trying that out at our school. So um, as you can see in the bottom left corner, there's me. I'm in a recording session. And um, basically what how this show is working, it's a cabaret style musical. And um, everything is done remote or like safely in the theater. So as you can see in the bottom center, it's filming in the theater with masks. And then the top center, we're filming out of the turf field. And then on the right, you can see me that is me in a curly brown wig in a showgirl costume in the back doing a little little pose that is me so that's really fun um basically we're putting on this show and it's so exciting like everyone in it is like filming in their houses and that's going to be ready hopefully in january so there's more to come with that so that has been something that I think there's like 20 students involved. It's very exciting. And everyone's really happy that we can just like keep doing theater during the pandemic. And even though it isn't perfect and it's not what we would want to be doing right now, it's something. So we're going to take what we can get. So yeah, that's awesome. So if we go to our next slide. Great. So this fall, we had a very successful uh sports season at the high school um there was boys and girls soccer cheering outdoor volleyball seven on seven football cross country and field hockey i think that's all of them if i missed any i'm so sorry um they all took place and everyone seemed to have a really good season i'm not an athlete i've never been an athlete i don't really like sports but you know it was really great to see everyone involved and um it just it adds a sense of normality to the school culture to still have sports. So it was really great. So yeah, that's everything for my report. So I'm going to toss it over to Gabby. Okay. So this random act of kindness board that's at um, Blue Point School. And basically what it is, is students when they complete one of these specific acts, like smile so big that people can see it without even your mask or with your mask, um, or like put your, put on your mask without being asked, they'll color it in. And this is used at home and at school just to create a positive environment and keep track of their kindness. And then if you can press play on the, this video. I don't know if you can hear it. okay okay well anyway that's what a music class looks like at Wentworth this is Mr. Needle's fifth grade class yeah and that's them practicing body rhythm and it's a way for them to get active being socially distant and it looks fun. I, I wish we did that at high school. But <laughs> And then at the top right, there's those are letters that Wentworth kids made to veterans for Veterans Day. And then in the bottom is an elementary school book fair. So it's a virtual book fair for the primary schools. And I know the book fairs were my favorite part, like one of my favorite things in elementary school. So I'm glad these kids still have the opportunity for like a somewhat realistic looking book fair and it seems fun so that's all thank you so much guys um i know that as board members not especially considering not all of us have kids and none of us have kids at every phase level so uh it's so nice to be able to get a glimpse inside the schools and, and especially from your perspective. So thank you. Agenda item 10.0 is new business. Agenda item 10.1 is appointments. Sandy, do you have the appointment ready? Sure do. High school choral music teacher, Jeffrey Mosher has been selected to fill this position created by a resignation. Mr. Mosher received his bachelor of music degree in voice performance from the University of Southern Maine and anticipates earning a second bachelor's degree in music ed in 2021, also from USM. He has been very active in several musical 
positions including Director of Music at Camp Takahoe in Naples, Maine. Voice faculty at the Portland Conservatory of Music as well as both the Director of Choral Activities and Voice faculty at the Murray Conservationatorium in Auburn, Albury, Australia. Mr. Mosher will be placed on step one of the bachelor's plus 15 scale per the collective bargaining agreement. The recommendation is to appoint Jeffrey Mosher as a high school choral music teacher. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Okay, Diane? Mrs. Giftus? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftus? Yes. Great, congratulations and welcome. Agenda item 10.2 is the meeting minutes for November 2nd, 2020. Do I have a motion? So, so moved. moved. Second. Discussion? Seeing none, Diane? Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Agenda item 10.3 is the meeting minutes of November 5th, 2020. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. For our discussion, um, I actually have two minor edits to the minutes. Uh, the first edit is that the vote to approve uh, Leanne Casalonis as vice chair, the vote should be reflected as six to one. And then later on in the minutes, um, the third resolution at the delegate assembly, um, our amendment did not pass, but the resolution itself did pass. And so the minutes should reflect that the resolution itself did pass, please. I know that was confusing because the delegate assembly is in and of itself confusing. <laughs> is there any other discussion? Okay, Diane. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Ms. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Okay, agenda item 10.4 is the Scarborough Public Schools Ad Hoc Equity Steering Committee. And I drafted the following language for a motion. Uh, I move to grant the approval of the Communications Committee to solicit applicants for the Scarborough Public Schools Equity Steering Committee. Do I have a second? Second. Discussion? Seeing none. Mrs. Giftis? Yes. Dr. Gill? Yes. Ms. Cavalonis? Yes. Ms. Layton? Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom? Yes. Mrs. Scyther? Yes. Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Agenda item 11.0 is our adjournment for tonight. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're ready, Diane. This is Giftis. Yes. Dr. Gill. Yes. Ms. Casalonis. Yes. Ms. Layton. Yes. Mrs. Lindstrom. Yes. Mrs. Scyther. 
Mrs. Turner? Yes. Mr. Bennett? Yes. And Ms. Giftis? Yes. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you. Good Thank, you. Good Thank you. Have a good weekend and next great. two weeks. Bye.